causing them to seek answers elsewhere. We now live in a society that teaches us to ignore faith and hope by hanging on what we, um, I'm just hanging on things that we can see. So the world is trying to get us to believe or live according to and lined up with statistical data, projected outcomes, psychological profiles, and social standards, and these things change daily. It's never static. It's never set in stone. It depends on what is, is going on for the time. We are now people that rely more on the information that comes out of a lab or research center, we pray, replacing the absolute truth given to us and recorded in the Word of God. See, I'm not dismissing the ability of the empirical data or scientific results. As a matter of fact, I do believe that there are valuable tools and gifts bestowed to us by God to enhance our quality of life. My point here is that oftentimes we use the same God-given gifts and knowledge to counter his truth, to ridicule his people, and discredit his holy word. This is why I wrote this article and why faith and hope were made on my mind. So today is the sanctity of life, of human life Sunday. It is a day when we all pause and reflect on this trauma and cancer in a society where we think it's okay to take life, or take the life of an innocent child. I've been curious as to why we have reached such a, and such, this, this, we have been have reached such a vast sector of our society, so eager to protect what we call a woman's right to choose. A topic that has caused tremendous division and hurt in our time. Now, for starters, I wonder why we have so many of a society accept the pro-choice position and why they are so fervent in their approach. That's my question. It is a question I keep asking. Why is there such a determination to make abortion not just legal, but to make the practice of abortion as normal as one going to a cosmetic clinic to remove an unsightly and undesired or worse or whatever. There are those who try in every way to dismiss the fact that they are born is a life. It is a life. Yeah. A life uniquely created by God with an ordained future for his kingdom. I could go through many verses that point that out. Point that out. We are wonderful in nature created for its purpose. We try our best to discredit the obvious fact that life does begin at conception. We use terms such as fetus, collections of cells, viable organism to describe the new life that, that has started in the mother's womb. This is a systematic attempt to prove that during the period of gestation, the unborn baby has no feelings, no senses, and is devoid of all consciousness. One of the labeling um, I came across for the unborn child on my blog, someone actually <coughs> challenged me on it, was that why should she worry about this mystic fetus that's in her? That's what they call it, a mystic fetus, not a child. This caused me to think, why would a person come to such a callous conclusion regarding a person's life? And what can I do differently to reach such a skeptic soul that God has placed in my path? Certainly, I've done my share of public expression, which I'm probably going to do in, in, a, in a couple of hours. Personal persuasion, and even use my rights to vote, all in effort to show the to slow the advance of abortion and eventually bring this practice to a halt. But there is so much more to be done, and I've become curious for a fuller understanding. 
Well, I figured if I was going to, to um, understand the views and concerns shared by advocates of abortion, I should look at this from a historical point of view and figure out how we got where we are in these modern times. I've settled on the obvious answers that most Christians accept, accept their view as being that they're secular, they rely on pure scientific results, they're too humanistic, or just simply they're ungodly people. But I don't think so. I wasn't satisfied with that. There have been, there has to be more to a society learned that should have learned in this approach to abortion. In my personal and answer explanation for my question, I first decided to research the history and root beginnings of abortion in this country and the reason why so many accept it as a necessity, as a necessity for society. As I started to research the root, the, the current and the current state of the abortion movement, the name that jumped off in front of me, and you may have heard this name before, is Margaret Sachs. Became front and center in my research because she's known to be the mother of pro choice movement. When I saw that, I went looking her name up. That was years ago. Ms. Sangster first promoted what is known and what's known as eugenics, a systematic approach to the elimination and quarantine of a certain group of people based on their race, social status, mental state of being. Ms. Sangster justified her belief by using gauging, a gauging system to label individuals as not being fit for society. And even went as far to say that it is most cruel for us to allow them to live because of their intellectual deficiencies or some physical deficiencies or that they probably just don't fit into society. Here's a person who was able to operate and influence many during her time with this warped way of thinking. Most of her followers were those who felt threatened by the new freedom given to the African American slaves immediately after the Civil War. They believed that over three million unskilled, uneducated, freed blacks could cause tremendous stress on our country's socioeconomic system. These concerns caused many in the upper class to sought a legal and quote unquote acceptable way to control the population growth of free slaves. A group of people that took notice of this work by Ms. Sangster and the writings on her um, topic of eugenics was the Nazi party in the late 30s and mid 40s. They not only took notice of her innovative, cutting-edge approach to population control, they went to the practice of making it a policy of their party and their country. The result of this evil is a well-documented tragedy in history. It's called Holocaust. With the world watching and living the reality of Nazi Germany atrocities and the knowledge that Nazi embraced the eugenics our model, Ms. Sangster realized that she was now under a microscope and decided to drop the name eugenics. That's why you don't see there very much anymore in society. People don't talk about eugenics anymore. Because this title was somewhat now tied into the Nazism. She changed her approach to her work and the cause she saw championed to gain wider acceptance from the public. As a result, Ms. Sangster reinvented her movement and the organization that went that organization to what eventually become known today as Plant Care Hood. She's the one that created that organization. Plant Parenthood is number one venue for abortions throughout the US. I could get into numbers and figures. I have that on another blog. It would take me a while to show you 
how many babies are being aborted because of just this one company. Just to give you an idea, they're responsible for over 300,000 abortions. That's 300,000 children that are ripped from our society. With most of the locations of these Planned Parenthood locations are located in the minority and low income neighborhoods. This is not by chance or just so happy. Now, it's not because of economic reasons. This was the onset of Planned Parenthood. Was it was to reduce the minority population. Now, to the present time, where we are right now, with this abortion debate, it's such a prior topic. We see much of it this last week. We'll get into that later. I call it the mutation of eugenics. A subtle yet over change so the evil cause can continue without alerting the people of God as a whole to the inhumane root and moral depraved beginnings. In modern times, abortion has ravaged the minority community in ways that are immeasurable with our history. If you take 57 million babies that are aborted since Roe v. Wade, and you take 30% or more of that that comes from the African American community, and you look at how much of our population was simply ripped apart, it's hard to measure. The magnitude of the damage was made possible because of the crafty ways that it was promoted over the years. Again, like eugenics, Proponents use scientific, statistical, and other early standards to justify the practice. However, there is a major change in the approach to distance themselves from the tainted type of eugenics movement. The first strategy pro-choice supporters adopted was to operate on the umbrella of care. Many women were forced or tricked into having abortion after being convinced that it was best for them. We care about you while we're doing it. I could tell you right now, if you go and Google eugenics, you see um, people that are living right now that didn't know that they were sterilized during this, the 50s and the 60s under this eugenics movement. Right, we, we can find out for ourselves. Let's go look. Then there is what I refer to as a probability factor. Men who were, who were coached into having an abortion were presented with probability and statistical projection, which in turn creates skeptics of them. They were staring away from the truth of the Holy One who created them, not just, who, not just only created them, but also created the baby that they tried. So this was the next talking point to use to convince many after the care generation. Society is bombarded with all kinds of probabilities if the mother decides to have her baby. Quite often they are able to fabricate even negative reasons, enough negative reasons to overshadow the positive ones creating skeptics out of the pregnant woman. I experienced this firsthand. To learn and I experienced this probability approach personally during the pregnancy of our last child. See, a certain test was done and performed to determine the health of the unborn child. Upon receiving the results, the doctor summons us to his office with some urgency and proceeded to inform us that the result was of some concern. It was a test. It was a test that based heavily on statistics 
and according to the results, along with the profile, the combination of both our ethnic background, we said there was a high than normal chance that our precious little baby would have Down syndrome. After first absorbing this unnerving news, we began to ask questions regarding the, the, the exam. And it became quite alarming when the doctor strongly recommended for us to get reproductive counseling, including scheduling an appointment for pregnancy therapy. Before we even go any further, that's what he said. This was even before we had a chance to even ask questions or give our opinion. The recommended, recommendation was based solely on the probability outlook, and his concerns for the welfare seemed genuine and, and sincere, but we realized it was deadly and misguided. At the time, we were young, somewhat naive in some sense, so we didn't even argue with him. We highly, this is highly trained professional, but we were convinced enough in our faith to know that he was dead wrong. We were, we just respectfully declined his offer and we walked out of his office and we never returned. We both knew that our baby, Down syndrome or not, was ours and that our Heavenly Father, who had created her in, in him, in his image, fearfully and wonderful way, would see us through any difficulties to come. That's not to say that we weren't concerned. We just rested on our faith and hope in God and to give us the strength we needed to get through the uncertainty to, to prepare us for the best. Well, I have here that this beautiful 14-year-old girl, that's when I wrote the article, but she's not 21. We went to her birthday party last week, that's, I mean, this her for her birthday last week in Tampa. That's where I went here at um, the church. She's not college student. You know, most of you know her. We refused to react to a statistical report and compilation of numbers designed to chart our future and make moral decisions for us. Instead, we turn to faith and hope as a basis for preparation to accept any condition that God places us in with our child. This is faith and hope approach. Now, presently, we are now entering into a more advanced stage which I will refer to as my choice. This current era has to be the scariest of them all, where decisions are not driven of the fear or the fear of the unknown, which in some sense is understandable when you fear something. It's just simply my choice. <coughs> See, our eyes have become so blind, our ears have become so deaf, and our hearts and are so hard that many among us no longer recognize the unborn child, the, un the unborn as a little child. Imagine that. We get to choose when the tiny baby grows inside a woman's womb or actually human or not. Nowadays, we are not experiencing what I refer to as serial abortion. These are young men and women, and I say young men, you're not utterly, you're, you're not innocent of this. You're just as much to the brain. Matter of fact, we are to blame for this. Who refuse to change their lifestyle of irresponsible sexual behavior and are not too concerned about getting pregnant because getting an abortion is so easily attainable. After all, it's my choice and I choose this form of birth control. We are not campaigning to have over-the-counter drugs readily available to terminate a pregnancy in its early stages. We want to just pop one pill, and then want it, annoyance of a pregnancy disappears. I wrote in one article that the child doesn't disappear. It's a human being. The soul goes back to God. And each one of those souls are, are, is, is a witness against us. Revelations, I don't remember the chapter where they point that out. When the martyrs cry out to the Lord, when are you going to revenge our blood? 
If we pay close attention to the lingo being used presently, we notice that there's a subtle but persistent effort to treat pregnancy as a disease now. By choice, when the baby is unwanted, it becomes a disease. So you see, the movement has crossed over three major thresholds. That's care, palliative care, and life choice. As a matter of fact, I wrote this size, again, I wrote it seven years ago. Recently, there's a new phase that's been popping up. The latest craze with the supporters of abortion is shout out your abortion. I don't know if you see that. I see that quite often. Matter of fact, a lot of the uh, movie stars are are, are, um, are doing this now. Shout out your abortion. One of the per famous persons that promoted this was Oprah Winfrey. I called up her name because she had it in her marriage. See, in other words, they're encouraging you to openly and publicly celebrate that you have an abortion. Comes with the hashtag and everything. Imagine that. Celebrate your abortion. Celebrate it. All three thresholds were able to exceed because our society had moved further and further away from a heart of faith and hope. Instead of placing or trusting God's holy word, society now relies heavily on the government and other secular-based institutions as our guide for life on war issues. The three thresholds were not attained overnight. This achievement by the pro-choice group was accomplished over decades with persistent campaigns, adjusting to social and economic changes and subsequent, sub, subsequent uh, invasion of other aspects of community, such as unbridled influence in our public schools, businesses, government, and yes, even in our church. What can be done to, to counter this evil that has spread its tentacles in all years of society? What is the responsibility of God's people? How do we approach the battle for the kingdom? You see, this is the burden of God's people today, to reach the lost, the broken, disenfranchised, and love them back to Christ. For the sake of the children, and for the preservation of our moral integrity, we must carry on with the work of ending abortion. I believe we have to focus on the heart of the community rather than the action of the abortion. In other words, we need to change society to rely on faith and hope rather than science and numbers. A society that will trust in God's holy word instead of man's worldly ways is still possible. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we will have to somehow let the world know that no matter how bleak it seems, your faith and hope in Christ will enable you to manage all situations. God's will for us is to be more is to be more like Christ. While Christ admonished secular government and religious fraction, he showed overwhelming concern for the heart of the people. Jesus accomplished this by demonstrating the greatest of love and compassion to every, everyone, especially the marginalized and those who are supposed to poor courage. This should be our focus today, to be more like Christ, not only in our nature and state of being, but also in our action. We should also be more like him when we go about doing our work for the kingdom. So while we petition the government to stop out the evil of abortion by making it illegal, we must not forget that the real battle is for the heart of the people. First, we have to acknowledge that this is going to be a slow process. So slow that we may not see the fruits of our labor in this generation. Abortion is so great in our community, we, it may not go away, you know, but we know that the Lord works through generations. Start with your own family because it is the youth of today who will be the ones running the last leg of this race. Remove any semblance of anger, that's one of our problems, when we go into society, and judgment from our public expression. We're not out here to judge anybody. When someone has an abortion or thinking of an abortion, we're not here to judge them. We're here to love them, to show them another way. This is not the love of Christ. 
illuminating from us is just alienate us from those we are trying to reach. Our goal should, should, should be to turn a people from a secular view to a life of one that is faith-based and cultural. Abortion is a practice that is, has existed, existed for centuries, reign is, is up ahead, and gaining momentum in various times on the certain political and social conditions. My thought here is that abortion, as we know it today, is one of the byproducts of slavery and the Jim Crow law that was accepted in this country. I say this because we know that eugenics was formed a few years after the Civil War to encounter the emancipation population order to free the slaves. Out of eugenics, Planned Parenthood was formed, which is the single most successful organization in the promotion of abortion. I did not make a connection and refer to this relationship to cause any controversy whatsoever. My only desire here is to seek an understanding of what we are really facing and to find an honest approach on how we should pray, minister, and campaign to end the abortion practice. As Christians, we do recognize and accept the concept of generational curses as a real, as a real effect, not only on individuals, but also on society, based on the sins of our fathers. This, the Bible tells us, is real. Does abortion have its roots uh, earlier collective sin of I don't know for sure. But we are reaping the negative repercussion of our forefathers' action during the enslavement of blacks in America. These are questions we should ask ourselves. Not to cast judgment on anyone again, get, don't get me wrong, not casting judgment on anyone. But to have a clarity of how we could be equipped ourselves to fight this problem. We can better prepare ourselves to minister to various groups knowing the past and present hurt of the community, both consciously and subconsciously. See, this approach will also help pro-lifers to be less judgmental and be able to minister with a greater sense of humility, knowing that we all have some involvement or another in the abortion process and how we got to this. A mother of this demonstration, demonstrate, de, sorry, the mother of, of this approach is demonstrated to us in the gospel story of Jesus Christ and the Samaritan woman at the well. Here's a woman Jesus knew of her past sins. He knew of her hurt and her disappointments. He knew of the individual and the society, societal burden that she carried around like a yoke on her neck. Yet he did not pass judgment on the woman. Instead, he used the information to reach out to her and minister to her and love her. With this approach, Jesus was able to restore her and her entire community who were for generations as brought, in, as brought into, the, into the ugly life that they were not, a good, that not good enough to be a part of the greater religious community. As a Samaritan woman, they weren't accepted with, a, with the rest of the Jewish community. They were so beautifully and compassionately enlightened by Jesus, which is with this reality of love and faith and the comfort of hope amid social separation and death as Christ ministered to them. So for us, it's going to be one person at a time. And through one generation at a time, we can bring back the hearts of the people to God. With this approach, we will not need governmental regulation to stop the progression of abortion. The government cannot fix what is broken between God and man. We will be a people of faith and hope in our Lord. For where faith abides, there is hope. For where hope dwells, there is life, which is in our Lord.
maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father. 